morning, Jason. Do we have many people on Zoom tonight? We have just a couple on Zoom. Yep. So just so you know, we do have folks on Zoom uh, joining us remotely. So I would just ask that in so much as we can speak clearly so that those those few folks um, can can hear the conversation as it unfolds tonight. Um, for those of you on Zoom, I'm assuming you can hear me. I'm hoping you can. Is there any way of knowing? I think they will let us know if they can. Okay, holler at us if you can. Of course, I guess they can. <laughs> yeah, right? We're good. But listen, if, if you guys on Zoom have comments, questions, concerns, or want to share any information with the group here tonight, we ask that you use your chat function and type those in. Jason Hunter's going to be running the Zoom for us tonight, and he can relay them what your thoughts are. So I guess maybe the best way to start tonight is, is introduce at least the game and fish folks that are in the room and I'll start. I'm Daryl Lutz and I'm a wildlife management coordinator for the Lander region. And, and of course the Sweetwater Rocks are, are part of my world. So um, start with Jason. Yep, Jason Hunter, I'm the regional wildlife supervisor here in Lander. Mitch Renteria, the South Riverton game warden. And I'm Sarah Hagan. I'm the West Rollins Game Warden. So you might ask why the West Wallens Game Wallens. Wallens. <laughs> Wallens. <laughs> Rollins Game Warden's here, but that the Sweetwater Rocks are actually part of her area. I'm Stanler and Wildlife Biologist Minor Jefferson. Hmm. Okay, so I think that's all the game fish folks, I think. So let's make sure we're all on the right flight, on the right airplane. <laughs> we're here to talk about the, the idea of introduce, reintroducing bighorn sheep into the Sweetwater Rocks. And I do want to stress that it's just an idea. The department has, does not have a proposal. We are literally coming to you tonight um, after I present you a little bit of information to hear what you have to say and what your thoughts, ideas, concerns, et cetera, are. So think of this. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to turn this into a, a federal agency meeting, but it's kind of scoping. We're here to listen to you. So, how did we get here? Um, or maybe a more appropriate question is, how did we get here again? So, we've actually the department has proposed to reintroduce bighorn sheep into the Sweetwater Rock several times, starting in the 1980s, and then again in 1999 and most recently in 2013 and 14. So why are we here again tonight? Well, this the Pathfinder Ranch um, made a proposal to the Wyoming Game and Fish Commission at their July meeting in Sheridan and asked the commission to direct the department to once again evaluate whether or not it was appropriate to reintroduce bighorn sheep into this part of Wyoming. So the commission chose to do that and directed the department to make that assessment. And you're all part of that assessment. So what I wanna do before we get um, too much further is to do this assessment, the department um, has to go through a really stringent process that's been outlined by the Bighorn Sheep Domestic Sheep Interaction Working Group. And that's a group of folks that have been getting together for over 20 years. They developed a plan um, that was codified in state statute in 2015. 2015. Um, I guess I could use my PowerPoint, means I've got it here. So that's the plan. That's the cover page off the plan. So there's an appendix. Well, let me just start out by stressing that the Wyoming Bighorn Domestic Sheep Interaction Working Group mission is to maintain healthy bighorn sheep populations while sustaining an economically viable domestic sheep industry in Wyoming. That's their goal. That's the purpose for that document. And again, it was codified in the state statute in 2015. Probably the most important 
part of that plan or what puts meat on the bones in this plan is this map. And I know that might be hard for some of you to see because you're sitting away in the back. But this is what delineates each of the bighorn sheep herds in Wyoming, where we currently have bighorn sheep, into one of actually four management schemes. So all of Northwest Wyoming is labeled bighorn sheep corn native. That's where most emphasis is put on the viable future for bighorn sheep. The next one is cooperative review areas. And that's what you see in this crosshatch, the Laramie Mountains, the Sweetwater Rocks, the Seminole and the Ferris, the south end of the winds right here at Lander, Devil's Canyon up by Lovell, and on the southern portion of the Snowy Range of the Sierra Madres. And we'll talk more about what these management designations mean in just a minute. And then we've also got bighorn sheep non-emphasis areas. That's where bighorn sheep exist, but that's not the emphasis. And that's the Wyoming range and the bighorn mountains. And then the rest of the state is categorized as non-management areas. So what do those mean? Well, a core native herd. Domestic sheep may occur within the boundaries of the coordinated bighorn sheep herds. All efforts will be made to prevent contact between bighorn and domestic sheep as agreed to by the statewide bighorn domestic sheep interaction, interaction working group. So the, the emphasis in coordinative is bighorn sheep. In cooperative review areas, and that's what the Sweetwater Rocks are in, so this, this is what we want to focus on. These are areas of suitable bighorn sheep range where proposed changes in bighorn sheep management or domestic sheep use will be cooperatively evaluated, cooperatively evaluated by the interaction working group and through this public process. A non-emphasis area. No effort will be made to prioritize or emphasize bighorn sheep unless agreed to by the statewide Bighorn Domestic Sheep Interaction Working Group. Any existing Bighorn sheep populations will not be protected at the expense of domestic sheep grazing. And then the rest of the state, non-management. There are areas outside of identified management areas. Bighorn sheep are permitted to occur in those areas, but are not actively encouraged. So that sets up the framework for how this interaction working groups plan is implemented. Durham? Yes, sir. So one that cooperative review area like Sweetwater Rocks is, and you see those others, my understanding from our previous conversation was, are those are areas where bighorn sheep had previously or historically been known to exist? I think that's a fair statement, correct. So I don't know, and you can answer this whenever. So if there was bighorn sheep in the Sweetwater Rocks country previously, how long ago, and you told me yesterday, but I can't remember. Yeah. How long ago has that been and what happened to that herd? So that's a good question. So the last known bighorn sheep in the Sweetwater Rocks was in 1980. So there hasn't been any there since that we're aware of. Um, if there has been, it's been wandering sheep, but again, not that we're aware of. They are the remnants of transplants done in the 1940s. <laughs> the Wyoming Game and Fish Department actually reintroduced or brought seven, Stan? Seven desert bighorn sheep, um, if I remember right, out in New Mexico and put them there. They didn't do well. And then we did two more supplement, tri supplemental transplants in the late 40s with 29. Bighorn sheep out of Dubois, if my memory serves me correctly, it was 29 sheep. And so those, those 36 sheep hung on for about 40, for about 31 years, 30 years. Um, and, and, and as most Dubois transplants in these low elevations, smaller mountain ranges have done, they dwindled and, and, and blinked out again in 1980. So Follow up is when you say they they dwindled. Yeah. Tell me what that means. 
So why, they, why did they why did they die off? Yeah. And, and what makes this group? Good, good question. So as you all know, Dubois, the Dubois sheep, the Whiskey Mountain sheep are a high elevation um, mountain range sheep. They migrate. They lamb later in the spring, typically around the 1st of June, and they just simply were not suited for this lower elevation, drier sites where, where migration probably wasn't a, an advantageous adaptation. <clears throat> The sheep that if we were to go down this road that we would propose to put in the Sweetwater Rocks are, are what we call non-migratory early lambing sheep that are more suitable and more similar to the subspecies of bighorn sheep that did occupy places like the Sweetwater Rocks, the Ferris and the Seminole and the Laramie Mountains called Audubonai um, and have done extraordinarily well in the Farish and Seminole, which are similar habitat types. Okay. Does that help? Yeah, just trying to get it around. Okay. Any other questions while I'm stopped? Did you, did you find that those sheep from Dubois actually migrated in, around the Sweetwater Rocks? Well, I don't know that I can answer that. Stan, do you have any insight? The records that I've seen don't really indicate in a lot of detail like that. So, and we did have a radio collar, so we may not know, but it's, I mean, Kim of Six, that was post World War II. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know that we would know them if they had. I can tell you that other transplants that we've done, like in the Ferris and Seminole in the 70s, those sheep did squirt all over the place. They moved. These sheep, um, that are um, sheep that we brought from Oregon and Montana, these early lambing, let, you know, non-migratory sheep, they stick close to where they were transplanted, in part because we're putting them in places where we know that's the best habitat, but also because they just don't have that impulse to want to move very far. Now, that doesn't mean some of the sheep, especially young rams, haven't done some 4As going and looking, but the majority of the sheep stick close to home, so to speak. What's the composition of this working group? I mean, mm -hmm. who are they? Uh, it's, it's a broad spectrum, are they all agency people? What's, who, yeah. who are they? So help me out here, folks, that the Interaction Working Group is are the Wyoming Wild Sheep Foundation folks, the Department Ag, the Game and Fish Department, and frankly, and the Wool Growers Association. And frankly, anybody else that wants to show up that day that we have a meeting, it's an open, it's an open group, it's an open working group. State veterinarian. Yeah, State vet yeah thank you. It's chaired, it's chaired by the department, human fish department and uh, the state vet. Yeah. And uh, you're right, I think BLM has sat in on it and and the Forest Service participates in it pretty regularly. Yeah. And other than that, it's, it's like you said, producers do show up under uh, wildlife uh, folks interests show up also it's just you know, livestock place. board usually there yep. yep but it's an open-ended group but yeah chaired by the game and fish and by the one who state back good question thank you anything else right now because this is the really boring part of what i have to talk about but it's really important and so this is really the process that we have to go through and you can just see by the number of bullet points on that page and then there's about twice that number of bullet points now don't start yawning yet because it because it does get really riveting here but we have to go through suffice it to say this is a very very thorough and i'm going to say intense process that we have to go because it's a cooperative review area we need to do this in such a way that it's i'm going to say collaborative and cooperative does on your map here that you were showing mm -hmm. um the, are there sheep in the cooperative review areas now? Correct, there is. So if you look at this, at particularly this cooperative review area, the Ferris sits, the Ferris sits right about here and the Seminoles are about here and that's a sheep herd of about 300 head. The, excuse me, the Laramie Peak herd unit. Um, the last I saw is similar number, about 300. This herd, this encompasses two herd units, the encampment and the Douglas Creek. And then this 
is one of our source herds for transplants that we've done to the Fair Seminole Devil's Canyon. And then this one is called, in general terms, the Temple Peak herd has around 100, I'm gonna say around 100, including what's on the reservation. So yes, there are sheep in the cooperative review areas, including the one we're talking about. And that little piece off the end of your, there's one right in the middle. Oh, right here? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's the Wind River Canyon off reservation. And there's sheep there too. There are a few left. <clears throat> so. Jim? When you say early lambing group, what, when is that window and does it coincide with the Seminole and the Ferris? Are they on the same schedule? They are. So they lamb about a month earlier. So peak and lambing about, about May 1. So when those forbs and grasses are starting to green up, those lambs are hitting the ground. And of course, the Dubois sheep are about a month later. And in these lower elevations, many of the grasses and forbs have already cured out. <clears throat> Okay, good questions. But that doesn't keep us from having to go through all this. <laughs> so the internal review, a potential transplant site is identified. We've done that. Um, and we'll I'll share this map, that map with you in just a minute. Um, we do a feasibility and suitability and a habitat evaluation. Um, we get a tentative commitment of funding support, which we haven't done because we don't have a proposal yet. So it's inappropriate for us to go after funding outside of the agency. We have identified a source of sheep. We would likely use Devil's Canyon up by level and also sheep out of the Ferris Seminole. Um, we develop a map of the anticipated range where transplanted sheep would likely exist. We document and look at the presence of domestic sheep on public or private lands. We complete a risk assessment or the likelihood of intermingling or mingling between bighorn sheep and domestic sheep. We think about a postseason population objective, which we have not yet done that. And then the land or region folks, the game and fish folks in this room will make a recommendation to our division's administration at some point in the next few weeks. You skip the sub bullet on the disease testing. Oh, and of course we have to disease test um, both source herds. So we will need to, and that's gonna actually happen at the end of this month and the beginning of next month, not because of this transplant, but because regardless what happens with the Sweetwater Rocks, we still have to be thinking about what to do with excess sheep in Devil's Canyon. So we do have to, we will be disease testing 20 sheep in Devil's Canyon and 30 sheep in the Fair Seminole. We have to test both the source herd and the recipient herd to make sure that we're not exposing naive sheep to, to the pathogens that cause pneumonia in bighorn sheep. Has there been any testing done in either one of those areas? Oh, goodness, yeah, all the line. Okay. So every time that we've see. done it, the transplants from the Devil's Canyon to Fair Seminole, we have to test them within 18 months of doing that work. Yep. And then externally, so then we, we contact the land management agencies, in this case, um, the BLM. And I saw Elisa somewhere, yep, with state lands. We still need to talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, talk to public land livestock permittees, contact potentially involved private landowners and lessees. And there's a bunch of bullet statements underneath this. We need to consider whether buffer zones around where big, we think bighorn sheep that exist would be sought. We need to think about hold harmless agreements with private landowners and lessees so that if there were a disease outbreak in bighorn sheep, those folks, lessees, permittees would be held harmless. It would not, it wouldn't be their fault. We would accept all the risk. Um, think about the ability of permittees to graze livestock, graze livestock on allotments permitted to them. And I'm going to say this, that we will ensure that permittees will have the ability to graze livestock permitted to them without any changes in so much as we can control that. Um, summarize all discussions for the official record, which this will be part of that. 
And then following one-on-one -on -one contacts, group meetings to discuss the proposal, including with land management agency folks, grazing permittees, private landowners, lessees, and of course, the yeah. domestic sheep, bighorn sheep interaction working group. If we find that there's support through all of that, then we proceed um, with feedback from all contacts. The department will hold those, these open houses. So this is only the first round of two rounds. And we'll talk more about pro the process in particular in a moment. Accept written comments, and I'll provide at the end of this PowerPoint presentation how you can do that and encourage you to do that. Summarize those written comments for an official account of support of opposition. Dard Regional supply, support, supply a summary of all of the input that we receive, provide that to the director's office and, of course, to the commission. Then, it, then any proposal would go to the commission. Um, this next bullet makes, makes me a little bit uncomfortable. Obtain voluntary agreements with cattle producers on public and private land that no conversion from cattle to domestic sheep will be attempted for 10 to 15 years. They're not required, but they're encouraged. And I think you'll see based on the map that we're gonna be looking at, the department's not too concerned about that. There should be a hold harmless agreement in place. I mentioned that earlier. And based on input from this meeting and the others that we hold, the region will develop a draft final proposal. And of course, at a later meeting, we'll, we'll get back with you and, and present what that proposal is, whether it is or is not to reintroduce. And then based on um, all of the input is how our proposal would be developed. So that's the process. Can we understand what in your whole harmless agreement is? So um, if in these kind of situations, and we did this with the fair seminal as well, if, and it's if, there is a disease outbreak in bighorn sheep, and if that can be tied back to domestic livestock, the producer would be held harmless. Does that make sense? In other words, a department will accept just how far out are you getting the whole harmless agreements signed by existing landowners? Do you have that's a good question, Justin, and something <coughs> to think about. Do you know on the Ferris or the Seminoles what that number might have looked like for that translocation? I well, so that wasn't. That was a supplement. So I, I know that we only did that with one producer, Jason, am I right? Yeah. And that was because that producer requested it with those supplemental transplants. So none of those producers have an existing whole harmless agreement in hand? Just one. But we would, I think it's fair to say we would be happy to provide that. But that's a good question about who we need to think about that with regard to this proposal. Yeah. Okay. Boring parts over. So, as we said, bighorn sheep existed in the Sweetwater Rocks through 1980. As a result of that, the Game and Fish Department has had a herd unit in red and hunt area boundary in place since. So, that's what you're seeing on this map is the herd unit and hunt area boundary that current exist, currently exists. The gray and hatch area on this map is the cooperative review area or a portion of that cooperative review area. The light green is likely suitable bighorn sheep habitat in the Sweetwater Rocks. The dark green delineates the wilderness study areas just for reference. So just to give you a little bit of geographic reference, hunt area and herd unit boundary, cooperative review area, likely suitable habitat, okay? This map shows the current domestic sheep allotments that surround or are within the cooperative review area. Some are active, some are not. Doesn't matter to us. We think they're all equally important in terms of our assessment 
whether or not it's appropriate to put sheep in the Sweetwater Rocks. This poly, this black polygon is the cooperative review area, the whole thing. So um, Crooks Mountain, Green Mountain, the Ferris, the Seminoles, Pathfinder, Alcova. So it's a big area. This area in orange is the area that if sheep, bighorn sheep are reintroduced into the rocks where the department would intend to keep them, that we would not allow bighorn sheep to establish outside of the cooperative review area within this orange polygon. The purple polygon, again, is what we think is appropriate or suitable bighorn sheep habitat. Lloyd? I think you told me you knew that in Devil's Canyon. So Lloyd's bringing up, I, I wanted to bring that up with you all. So you heard me say that if this were to happen, we would keep sheep within, within this area. And I can say that with a, with a high degree of confidence because we're doing that. We've demonstrated mm -hmm. that we have the ability to keep sheep in the Devil's Canyon herd unit. And we do that with a variety of tools lethal removal by department personnel, hunting, and what we call a chapter 56 permit, issued actually in this case to a, to a domestic sheep producer. That if he sees bighorn sheep uh, mingling with his domestic sheep, he has the authority to remove the bighorn sheep lethally. I don't know that that's been used, but it's in place. So I think it's important for everybody to understand that we would not allow or, or it's our intent to restrict bighorn sheep distribution within this polygon, they would likely occupy only a small or a smaller portion of that polygon, but will not be allowed to establish outside of it. Done? You said that you had a hunt area. <clears throat> the sheep in this area hunted now. No. Oh, yes, in the first seminal they are. In that cooperative but not area. in the cooperative review area. They are hunting in the first seminal. We issued eight tags this past year. The hunt area that you talked about did not include the hunt area around the spare seminal. Yeah, so this hunt area and herd unit boundary, this is Muddy Gap, the Dry Creek Road, the Ferris and Seminole are down here. Did I confuse you? Yeah. That's the I intended to. That's Good job. So again, the Sweetwater Rocks, this, this hunt area and herd unit boundary only encompasses where bighorn sheep used to exist in the Sweetwater Rocks. So your hunt area isn't the same as your cooperative management area. It is not. So this is the cooperative review area. So we would propose to keep sheep in this portion of the hunt area. From here to the east and from the cooperative review boundary to the south. Bounded on the south by Highway 287 and on the east by and southeast by Highway 220. How big is that Paris herd? Did you say about 300 head? And you take eight out of there, is that right? Well, we've taken more out of there, but we upped it from five permits <coughs> last year to eight this year. And, and based on preliminary discussions, may increase it again this year. Yeah. And starting, and I'll bring it up here, <coughs> starting to talk about new land licenses in the Paris Seminole to keep that population near its objective. <laughs> Did I confuse anybody else? Not to single dug out, but <laughs> that's okay. My yes, shoulders are broad. Yes, what, would be, what would be your objective for maximum? Let's say this plan goes and everything. What's the maximum number of sheep you want in that area? That's a great question. And to be truthful, we haven't gotten into those weeds yet. But at <laughs> least based on the assessments that have been done in the past by the BOM and the assessment that we've had done, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. I'm going to say somewhere between two and four hundred. So let me talk a little bit about where we're at in that process. So obviously we've gone to 
um, the landowners and permit fees in and around that orange polygon. And, and have talked to them about their level of support and more importantly, what their concerns would be if a, if a proposal were to go forward. So we've done that sometimes on multiple, having talked to many landowners on multiple occasions and permittees. We've also contracted with the University of Wyoming, the Hobbs School in particular, Kevin Montes, to do an independent assessment of habitat suitability for this area for bighorn sheep. He also conducted the risk of contact analysis. And again, remember that's the risk of bighorn sheep mingling with domestic sheep and vice versa. And at least based on that assessment, we are confident that that purple polygon would provide suitable, um, probably good bighorn sheep habitat. We think they would be viable there. And the risk of contact is similar to that what it is in the fair seminar. So because we are comfortable with the amount of risk in the fair seminar, we would be comfortable with the amount of risk here. And then we're doing these public meetings. We met in Jeffrey City last Thursday night and met with oh, 20 plus folks. We're doing this tonight, obviously, with you folks. We're going to step away from from these meetings, and we're going to we're going to finalize the assessment that UW did for us. And I want you to know that that'll be available to you all um, by December first, not November first, which is what I said in Jeffrey City. So you should see that in a couple of weeks. You'll all have that at your fingertips and and can pour through that in so much as you like. Um, and then we're going to we're going to start developing what we think is appropriate, at least from a biological perspective, what's appropriate um, for this area. Then we would like to come back to you on December 14th in Jeffrey City and December 15th here and update you where we're at. It was our idea to have a proposal to present to you and we may still be able to do that, but at minimum we would come back to you and at least update you where we're at in our evaluation. Then we are gonna provide an update, at least an update to the commission, to the Wyoming Game and Fish Commission in late July, or eight, late January, I did that too, late January. So that's the process we have to go through per Wyoming state statute. And that's where we're at in the process as of tonight. So we're here to answer any questions or listen to anything you've got, but I want you to please, if you've got comments, concerns that you want the commission to see in particular, you've got to do it in writing. And there's two ways to do that. Either send them to me via the postal service at that address, or you can get on the internet, of course, right? And go to that link and you can fill out a form that's on that's on the internet. So please do one or the other if you want the commission and us to see your written comments. Jim. Could you tell me about the proponents that brought this to you aside from Pathfinder? Is there what's their motivation? Is this is this <coughs> is is it a a hunting scheme long term, or is it a wildlife kind of scheme long term? What's what's the what's driving this proposal? Yeah, I can't answer that question. I wish they were here tonight to talk about that, Jim. I honestly don't. I don't know for sure. Kelsey. So, with your timeline, if it goes to commission in January, if this was to move forward with the proposal, when would she be on the ground, or you know, if this was, what's the end? timeline here for this moving if, if it was to go that way yeah if everything went lickety split and there was no controversy or no questions it could go as early as february or march 22 in a few months it could yes ma'am could you go back to that map please you bet maybe okay that one yeah that one <laughs> cred <laughs> Did I 
hear you say that it, the purple that you have talked to all the landowners and permittees in that uh, purple area? That we're aware of, yes, ma'am. And what was their comments? It varied. So there was quite a bit of support. There were a good number that were opposed and a good number that were undecided. Could you give me a, like a estimate, I guess? I'm going to ballpark around 50% of them were supportive. A quarter of them were opposed and a quarter of them were undecided. Okay. And Daryl, I think real quick, it's safe to say too that the landowners and producers out there that were supportive, their their concern, the only concern they, they had was still back to the, the grazing issue and, and something happening to public <coughs> land grazing in the future. So I'm glad just Jason brought that up because that was the primary concern, whether they supported or were opposed. They are concerned about any changes that may be imposed on them that would affect their their ability to graze livestock on, on primarily public lands. And I want you to know that our director is also in the department, is keenly um, concerned about that, is keenly aware of that concern. And our director provided the landowners and the BLM a letter, a letter ensuring them that if the corn sheep were used as a lever to try to force the BLM into making some changes with regard to livestock grazing, that the department would remove all the Bitcoin sheep. Justin. So in the presentation or calls that you've made to the landowners, what did you actually present to them? Because you don't have a proposal. So it's kind of difficult probably for them from their perspective of what would they actually have seen or heard from you? Because I would say, based on what we've seen before is that this area has been refined and so i don't know how many landowners fall within that red polygon but that would be something i'm curious as to whether or not that they've seen where their land ownership pattern falls within that polygon and what was presented to them do they know the total number of sheep do they know um, the details, because that's yeah, that's none the of the details. details. Right? So just presented them with the idea. Many of them are aware of what's been proposed in the past. We did provide them with some talking points, and I don't remember them off the top of my head. So I would ask the three of you to help me with that. But we provided every one of them with the same talking points and asked them um, two or three questions in research. Until you would know the proposal. It's hard to say what are they agreeing to and what are they. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. And that's the reason for bringing any kind of proposal back to them before it goes even to our <clears throat> department's admin. That's a good point. So, with the uh, concerns that uh, Jason said were identified by landowners on expanding restrictions on livestock grazing and using the bighorn sheep as that nexus to do that, uh, Director Nesvik sent that letter out and said that, that so Director Nesvik's driving home tomorrow and he dies, okay? Mm -hmm. What guarantee or what assurance then would we have that that would be carried forth to the next director? And I think that's a good driver? question. And, and of course, that's a question I'm not sure that can be answered other than to say, you want them? Other than to say, here, I'll let you do it then, please. Other than to say that it's a department commitment, it's not a director Nesbitt commitment. It's a commitment by the department. And it was stated by both me and our division chief, our chief game warden, that the department has a strong track record of living up to those commitments. Hold on, Doug. Chris and then Doug. And, and Carol, I think it's you said the, the King of Fish is, is comfortable with the, the risk uh, with this proposal. And you also said that uh, you're comfortable with the risk that was for the, the Seminole Ferris. But in the Rollins RMP, um, they have a, a 650,000 acre avoidance area mm -hmm. around the domestic sheep avoidance area around the Seminole Ferris. And again, Meepa is a different beast. I understand all that, but but uh, you know if everybody's comfortable with that, we 
that I think that's the biggest concern is is what does the BLM do just like they did in Rollins RMP. Yeah. As a follow up with that, if I could, Daryl, just say in, in regards to the risk of contact, when you do, when you look at that avoidance area, the amount of buffering that that's already created is not apples to apples. When you look at the polygon that's being proposed tonight, and you have that yellow directly on that south side, that is not, um, per se, equitable to, in relation to the distance from the Seminole or Ferris in relation to domestic sheep raising. So to say that the risk of contact would be something equitable or relatable probably isn't a fair, fair statement. Yeah, I would say that yellow polygon is pretty close to the Ferris Mountains too, pretty similar distance to the purple and the Sweetwater Rocks. I think the key would be then if we could look at then where that relation to the um, Rollins Field Office boundary is and where their uh, avoidance areas fall. And just so folks understand the risk of contact, well, it's just a model, I get that. But the, the model for risk of contact is a concentric rings that you go further away. The further away from the, the herd is, is less risk. But I think that that does go up to, I think, approximately 22 or 26 miles. Yeah. The other so thing that I think we need to remember, though, is it's also based on a lot of collar data with those sheep that we would propose to put here if we were to go down that yeah. road. And I, and I think, Daryl, you, you mentioned at the, the working group meeting that direct collar data from the, the Ferris Seminole was 20 miles that we had a full rate. It's not the migration yeah. is, is the issue. It's, it's just it's the, the foray. foray. It's the foray. And the risk of contact model is based on foray of, yeah. these, of these brands. Yeah, the probability of the foray. And if you do put a 20, 26 mile concentric rings out there, almost every one of those um, domestic sheep allotments are, are touched. And that's a risk that we would accept. Yeah. Doug. What do you mean? Do, what do you mean by that's a risk we would? So if the domestic, if the bighorn sheep were to mingle with domestic sheep, whatever that risk is, the department is willing to accept that risk on the backs of bighorn sheep. That's our problem, not the producer's problem. And I think an example, though, Daryl, is, is even in the fair summit I've heard, we, we have had those wandering sheep. And once they get outside of the herd unit, um, we lethally remove them. Um, yeah. Just because we have no idea if they have had contact uh, with, with domestic sheep, and so they're they're removed, uh, and then we'd be doing the same thing here. We would lethally remove sheep that were outside in those areas. Yeah, we do that to minimize the risk of them bringing pathogens back right. into the herd. So that's our problem. Right. Um, the idea of keeping this reintroduced, and I'm not a sheep herder, there's people in here do it, I mean, all the time, I don't. But how is a game and fish going to keep a herd in that area? And you talked about, well, there's brands of bighorn sheep that like to roam, and there's some that like to stay at home. And you're going to put the stay at home brand here. But I guess it, it seems like, one, you guys got a lot to do already. Do not hurt bighorn sheep around that little red polygon, and the cost associated with it is a concern. It could be, yeah, it could be, but um, well, how can you keep them there? I guess boil that down to us. Well, a couple thoughts. One, I don't know that we would have a lot. We're going to have some sheep that move. There's no question. Some, but they are going to. We're confident that if this were to go forward, given the habitat suitability. And the kinds of habitats that surround the rocks, they're going to stay pretty close to where we put them, especially given what we've seen in the Fair Seminole. They, they literally stick to home. The second thought I've got is, at least initially, all of the sheep will be radio colored. So we're going to uh, only know how they move about and what their forays are. We're going to know where they're at in uh, almost any given time of day when we go get them. So at least initially, that's easily done. Once that herd grows and all the sheep aren't collared, that becomes a little bit bigger or a little bit different animal. 
but we've demonstrated that we can do it in the Devil's Canyon herd, and and the department's willing to commit to doing that. Is the only reason those sheep stay in that ferris is because they like home? I mean, why and why haven't they moved throughout that black polygon? Yeah, so it's pretty interesting that because even in the ferris, we transplanted on um, the last two or three transplants in a in a recent bird on the east end. And that's where they're at today. They have not moved. They live there. Now, we have had some rams that have forayed all the way up to this rock pile. Um, but the lion's share, the majority of sheep have lived right there without leaving. Because it's good habitat, for one thing. Everything they need is right there. Even, you know, this is kind of an interesting discussion, but you probably all know that Pedro Mountain burned, what, three years ago, two years ago? I don't remember. <clears throat> but almost all the Pedro, the entire mountain burned. And we've got sheep in the Bennetts and the Seminoles that live even as far north on, on Gigi Cordes' place that they can see that and smell it when that has greened up and it turned really green this summer, and early in the summer. They did not go over there and they could see it and smell it. They stick to home. Daryl, got a couple of questions. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, is the exclusion zone or the, the buffer implemented by the Rollins Field Office in response to a bighorn sheep transplant in the 60s, uh, something that will absolutely happen in, in this Sweetwater Rocks area or are there other mechanisms of separation that could be used? Yeah, and I can't speak to whether or not there would be a similar buffer buffer implemented in the Sweetwater Rocks by the lander BLM, but it's not something the department would seek. Um, and then in, with regard to other separate other techniques to provide separation, I think just by virtue that we identify that boundary as a hard boundary provides a separation that we would be most concerned about. Well, Darrell, a follow up on that. So, the timeline that you gave that, that mentioned uh, um, if everything went perfect, that technically sheep could be introduced in February, March, and you know, that's concerning to us. But to, what, what do you, what is the feel as the role of the BLM in this process then? Say so what did you ask? What is the role of the yeah? Because because you said that if everything went perfect with the timeline, you know that the, the mm -hmm. commission will review it in late January. You said to Kelsey um, that if everything went perfect, you could actually have introduced sheep in here by by February and, and March, whatever. So if if that's your your thought process, what do you what does the game and fish department feel is the role of the, the BLM in this process? Then? Well, I mean, from other than just keeping them informed, if bighorn sheep are put on private land, I don't know that they have any any other role. If they're put on private, or if, I mean, all of the purple is BLM. It, it no, is. it's not. I mean, but it is. Well, it's it's mixed over here. It's like the WSA. So the WSA. WSA. We talked about earlier. That's pretty much overlaid with all of the rocks. Mm -hmm. So the BLM would. Pretty much by guarantee have bighorn sheep on. Yeah, bighorn sheep are going to certainly occupy the own lands, but it would probably not be our intent to actually open the gate, park the trailer, and release them on BLM. They'd be released on private land. And it's our understanding that that doesn't then require an EPA. <laughs> And in relation to Jason, if you could go back to that particular question in regards to the Rollins RMP and the, the um, what is it, the avoidance, avoidance area. Yeah. That is in relation to the translocation of both Ferris and Seminole because the RMP in 2008 does state specifically that there is a requirement under BLM policy and regulation to create separation between domestic sheep and bighorn sheep. So that is the process in which Rollins BLM utilized in order to ensure that separation. So that's where Chris brought up the 65,000 acres that is 
I identified as an avoidance area, which does prohibit any future permittee from doing a conversion from cattle to sheep or for um, inclusive of any permittee at this point of putting any domestic sheep within those areas. So if I remember your map right, Chris and Justin, that, that exclusionary was to the south of the Ferris? No. No, it's no. north. Up it, to it, it actually borders that red um, on I think on the sides of the muddy gap and then up goes along the highway to 20 and border goes all the way to the that allotment. That yellow one. This one it's it's Scott. It's, yeah, yeah, it follows them. it just crosses that into the road and yeah, it goes up quite a bit south. It doesn't cross into the lander, obviously, that they can't provide direction for another field office. Mm -hmm. So their avoidance area only does cover the Rollins field office. And that's, so that goes into another question we just got. Has the Lander field office ever considered a buffer area given that the bighorn sheep in the area in the past were the, sh when there were sheep there in the past, did they consider extending the exclusion area that butts up against their boundary? So that area that goes then into the Lander yeah. field office has the lander BLM ever considered doing anything? And then, then follow up to that is again, there's there are other mechanisms to do that, not just creating buffer areas. Yeah. So to my knowledge, the BLM has not considered doing that, but um, I I don't know for sure. I think you would have had to have had an actual bighorn sheep herd because based on the regulations, it would require. Bighorn sheep to occupy, actively occupy that area in order for them to make management uh, changes or recommendations. Here's the last half in 41 years or more ago. They didn't do anything with the bighorn sheep that did occupy the yellow hills on the Green Mountain side of that um, because they weren't intended to be there. So that was just kind of a they were there, they didn't really cause any problems and, and they didn't really expand. Doug? There's been sheep in that purple area you said, but they've died off several times. Well, yeah, I mean, Autumn and I, the subspecies was extirpated probably sometime in the, in the early of 20th century, and then we reintroduced them again in the middle of the 20th century in the 40s, and they died off. Why? The, well, so pro, I'm, I'm speculating here, but in all likelihood, Autumn and I, just as they were extirpated from the other mountain ranges in southeast Wyoming, including the Fair Seminole and Laramie Peak, they were probably hunted to extirpation. And then as we talked, the transplants just weren't the right sheep for the place. Billy. Barely mind if I uh, go up and point something no, please. out of perspective. Yeah, please. So we're looking at this big map, but really this area is only under control by a couple of landowners. Pathfinder Ranch has all of this. And they are extremely in favor of this project. I'm going to read a letter that they asked me to read today. And then I'm an owner and manager of Split Rock Ranch, which borders Pathfinder coming this way. And our boundary comes down to here, goes all the way up to the rim and back down with a lot of this core area. I also have four pivots, one being the largest pivot in Fremont County of Alfalfa. So arguably, we have the most to lose from that side of the coin but we are completely in favor of this. The majority of the best habitat in this purple area is completely under control of Pathfinder, Split Rock, not shared allotments. We've got the only irrigated agriculture. We've got 14 miles of river. The BLM allotments that we do graze on, which go from up here, clear down to here, does not include anything in that wilderness study area. So there's no net loss to our cattle grazing or any other thing because it's something we can't graze or have been charged to graze in the first place. I've looked at this from every angle possible. We do not want to step on any of our neighbor's toes and want everyone to succeed out here. But in all honesty, I can't think of a better place for sheep to be. There isn't, there isn't a domestic sheep in here anywhere close. 
And if we need to sign something that says that we will not try and convert cattle AUMs to sheep AUMs, we'll gladly do that. I've had the same conversation with Pathfinder. They're completely on board. Some of the stuff down here is our deeded, same as over here. Um, another neighbor that I've just spoken to recently on the 46 Ranch has also voiced support. You know, so it's it's not this huge group of people out here that you would think of that people might be making it sound like that to be. It's mainly just a couple of core ranches that are in favor of this. And I will read the letter from Pathfinder right now. They couldn't be here today. They're uh, in Kansas City doing some, some stuff with a bigger ranch. Pathfinder Ranches is unable to attend the Wyoming Game and Fish Department's public meeting in Landry related to wild sheep reintroduction into the Sweetwater Rocks. Although we cannot be with you in person, we did want to submit comments regarding the Bighorn Sheep reintroduction effort. We do plan to attend the department's hearing on November 10th in Lander, but we're unable to do so. One of the significant challenges in ranching is to balance livestock management with wildlife considerations, including elk, greater sage grouse, bighorn sheep, and mule deer migration management. We often speak about this balance in a way that suggests that is an obvious and necessary outgrowth of all Western range and ranch management. From experience, such balance is easy to talk about and sometimes hard to accomplish. We ranch with wild sheep on five of our ranches. To date, we have not experienced any loss of grazing rights or permits and will actively fight any efforts that seek to disrupt our or our neighbors' grazing businesses. What we have experienced is a shift in thinking. Ranching and wild sheep and other important habitats has sharpened our talents to recognize opportunities to benefit wild and domestic ungulates alike. We install more water, better fencing, and monitor intensively to ensure that the rangeland health needs of one only benefit the other. At the end of the day, no matter where you ranch, agribusiness is not an exercise of robotically moving from calving to weaning to feeding to processing. Ranching is recognizing the needs of the land and striving to improve it. It is also recognizing we are not singular fixtures on the landscape we have temporarily been entrusted to occupy. Wild sheep once inhabited the land within the Sweetwater Rocks complex. We now have the ability and the responsibility to bring them back, and we should, without reservation. That was Ryan, the president, and Matt, the director of operations. And I also brought my prop that I had at the Jeffrey City meeting. This is the remnants of a bighorn ram that I found in the Sweetwater Rocks near the actual split rock itself. We were hiking this summer and found this big stone corral that had been there forever. The lichen on top of the rocks was thick, no lichen underneath. Went off to a drop point, found some bases of arrowheads and spear points, that kind of stuff, milling around. Looked back up, there was a little overhang and some stuff stashed in there. This was in there, it had parts of the sheaths, but it seemed to be touching it. Um, after last week's meeting in Jeffrey City, I thought we were going to have quite a bit of opposition from the locals, but it turned out a lot of locals came and talked about how they found a lot of big sheep skulls in the mountains and that they were actually excited to see them back there too. So honestly, from a producer in the area and one that probably has the most to lose, I can't tell you enough how much in support we are of this, working with our neighbors, working with the department. A lot of this is public land. If this does happen, this is going to be a huge benefit for sportsmen. Having wild sheep in a place like the Grand Mountain would be an unbelievable opportunity for hunters. And the majority of it is public. So there's there's nothing holding people back from that. I think it's our duty to try and keep Wyoming as wild as possible. We don't live here for the Starbucks and the culture. We live here because Wyoming's an amazing place and we should we should foster that every chance we get. Something I'll just to talk a little bit more about the the idea of, of, uh, of putting them on private and having them run to the, the suitable habitat there. Um, it'd be interesting to see uh, with that, that concept that, that uh, how much of the suitable habitat is actual BLM versus private. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then is there any other cases that you can give us where that that concept is because the human fish has done that in the past of where you you, you release them because we know it's WSA you can't drive into the, the rocks um 
where you put them on private, knowing the intent is that they're going to run out to, to BLM. Yeah, I, I, I guess the you know, one example that comes to my mind is years ago when we were proposing to put them in, for example, Glen, uh, Glendale Canyon DORs told us just make sure you do that on private land so it doesn't trigger NEPA. Uh, it's my understanding that in the fair Seminole, particularly in the Ser in the Seminoles, we avoided um, BLM lands for the same reason to avoid NEPA. I've got a supplemental transplant. I got something I can add to that because I just talked to BLM today. Their current management plan for the Sweetwater Rocks Wilderness Study Area has a very clear couple of pages about how they will support and help in any reintroduction of native species. And that's in the current plan right now. And then also within that purple area, the wilderness study area, there's a grid of roads almost down every major drainage. So it's not just one blocked off area. You can get around all over the place. Is your hand up? No, really. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, I understand that there was a reintroduction years ago that Sweetwater Rocks sheep and, and they it was unsuccessful what was the cause of that yeah so again those were those were those were de desert bighorn sheep in the early 40s right and then whiskey mountain sheep in the late 40s and they were just the wrong sheep for the place they weren't adapted for it they land too late the dietary selection for those sheep is different than what the rocks provide they were the wrong sheep for that place well i didn't know there was that Big difference. There actually is a lot of difference. Huh. Yeah. We put, for example, we put um, Whiskey Mountain sheep in the Fair Seminoles multiple times through through the late 1900s, and they never worked. These, again, early lambing, non-migratory, more shrubs in their diet, sheep that we bring from Devil's Canyon. Have have flourished in the Ferris and Seminole where two boy sheep did not. Yes. Well, we live out there and I I've looked at a lot of maps, agency people have drawn, and I've never seen an animal abide by any of those boundaries mm -hmm. that get drawn on maps. And if the habitat is suitable in that. Polygon is probably suitable in most of that entire map on that screen. And there's nothing to stop any kind of animal, sheep or otherwise, from going any direction from there. And I think there's a fair amount of predator issues that we haven't, that we don't realize are there. I think there's going to be pressure there that's unanticipated. There are more cats out there than we've ever seen. For what reason, I don't know. The deer are declining in our particular part of that area. We think it's predators. And also, as much goodwill as gaming fish has to the landowners there, I really, I know by experience, you guys don't have much influence over federal agencies. Yeah, we don't have any. And we can promise a lot of things, and we appreciate that. But our experience has been when regimes change in federal agencies, this all goes out the window, it's goodwill. And that's been our experience. So as I said, at Jefferson City, nobody I think is against wildlife, but we have to live there. We have to continue to raise our families there. And I'm voting against this at this time. Yep, okay, thank you. Justin, I have a question for Billy. Um, so either the split rock or the pathfinder, do either of those ranches run sheep? No. That would be my, I guess, concern, obviously, is that you had said you don't have any concerns and you have a lot to lose, but I think it's the sheep, domestic sheep producers that probably- There isn't one sheep allotment or sheep producer in that polygon, in the purple or the red. So no state lands, no private, because um, you don't own all of the private within the red polygon, correct? Mm, I'm assuming that there are all. others that no. are in there. I don't know. I just don't know personally whether or not that there are sheep producers here that fall within that red polygon 
that run either private or state in that. You know, it, it looks like everything on that map is the same, but if you actually go out there, the granite mountains, the Sweetwater Rocks are very abrupt, they're very steep. There's a lot of hidden water and pasture back in there. And then once you go north, it becomes like the face of the moon. It's just flat, there's no water, except when we got our pipelines going, feeding tanks. And I think there's a lot of geographic boundary here that people might not be really taking into account. If you haven't been out there, it's it's desolate as it gets. There's sand in up there for miles. It's, it's a whole different kind of world. And Justin, to our knowledge, given the landowner contacts and our knowledge of landowners out there, we're not aware of any sheep producers on private land. Yeah. <clears throat> but I'm glad, I really appreciate your comments and I appreciate you bringing up, especially, you know, and I agree with you, sheep are not going to abide by a, by a line on a map. But we are also able to, um, again, dem we've demonstrated that we're able to keep sheep within the Devil's Canyon herd. And I think we can do it here. It's going to take a lot of effort. It's certainly going to take some money to do it, as Doug said, which is a concern. Another factor there, Daryl, is this country we're looking at there is about as uninhabited as you can get. There's probably the most minimal activity there in the industry. Mm -hmm. You know, all these other areas, what little I know about them. There's interstate highways of inside of this. A lot of these other areas, there's, you know, there's there's towns, there's, you know, there's coaches, <clears throat> things like that. This country is a little different. Well, but the Devil's Canyon, if you're comparing this to Devil's Canyon, well, it's really remote and isolated as well. Yeah, but these other areas where you know sheep are, do boys, for example, that's just people crawling all over, living all over. But yeah, but, you know, there's a there's a lot of factors here that we don't know. There's a lot we don't know. You're right. But but the one thing that I do want to say is we do know and we agree with you that we are going to have to be concerned about predators and probably in particular cats. And so if if we were to make a proposal to reintroduce sheep, and again that's an if, well, there would be a strong component in that proposal to to do predator management, um, particularly with cats as the need arises. So we, we agree with you on that. I'm not right. worried about mortality in the sheep. I'm worried about them pushing those sheep. I, and I heard you say that, you know, Roger. But let me just say <laughs> that we had the same problem in the Ferris Seminole and it did not push those sheep around that we know of. Again, they have stuck to where they're at, knowing that they do exist with cats and the other predators that may that may prey on. I don't want to filibuster, but um, this fall and winter, we're going to have three different guys with hounds coming in to hunt cats all winter for different reasons, but it'd be great for this as well. And a couple of guys that are going to be going after coyotes, trapping and doing a lot of hunting with thermal cameras and all kinds of other things. And then this might be a good question for Stan, but I don't think the quota has ever been filled for cats in this unit because there isn't that many. Or they're spread out. It, it is still it's very, very rarely filled. And I looked the other night in Jeffrey City, the quota is six for a big area of uh of on area 16. It includes the Green Mountain, Ferris, Seminole, Rattlesnakes, and there's such a limited amount of land running out there that it, it's been very rare in the 17 years I've been in land that that's filled if it has at all. I haven't built the full. Store yeah, and there's things we can do with the hunt area boundary too. We can even focus hunter harvest in a particular portion of that hunt area or whatever too. There's options that we can we can look at with at least lion hunting and also do agency pay. Doug, did you say earlier in your presentation that if this reintroduction took place and it affected negatively? BLM grazing permits, you would remove all of the sheep. If Did I hear you say that? The director provided the letter to the BLM and to the landowners that if the BLM were to make any changes, whether they did it through their RMP or or maybe they the reason they did it is because they were sued by somebody on the backs of bighorn sheep, then the bighorn sheep would be removed. Just clarify. So the all the Sponsored 
I think I was, uh, Doug was asking that question. So not just the, the sheep that caused the problem, you're saying all the wild sheep will be removed. In that red polygon. Yeah. The bighorn sheep would be removed from the landscape if they were used in a negative way. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not like this guy that's kind of new to the area. I've been around that area a little bit, 50 some years, dealt with the BLM. And I asked this question at the grazing board meeting last. I said, where are you guys at the BLM meeting? I said, where are you guys with this introduction? I said, we're neutral. Somebody said, well, what about our permits? Oh, nothing will happen to the permits. Well, I had a grazing permit out there for a number of years. And when the Game and Fish decided they wanted to create ferret habitat, we ended up with terms and conditions where you could jeopardize your permit by killing prairie dog. We have terms and conditions for wolves and bears. They're nowhere around there. So when we say it won't make, you know, plus that conversion factor, you kind of went around that. That is problematic. Maybe this gentleman doesn't want to convert to sheep, but the presence of sheep can have a negative effect on grazing permits, cattle, and sheep. So, you know, the RMP is the RMP. That avoidance area down there is, is problematic. I don't believe it's in this land or RMP. It's not. It's not. And Chris's point is that because we're all in the BLM, considered it, looked at it, and did it, do we need to be concerned about the lander? Field office doing the same. Well, they won't ever, they won't amend an RMP. That would <coughs> like cut on your throat. So, uh, they won't do that. But there's also when wild game, but up against domestic livestock. Domestic livestock always has to give. That's a fact. I don't care how much dressing you put on that. That's the concern about this deal. You know, it sounds great. You know, this guy's a proponent, Pat finds a proponent, that's fine. But it's not just that area, it will affect much more. And I've seen it. Also, it said in here one, one other comment is that the existing uh, bighorn sheep populations will not be protected outside of this area. Is that correct? Well, uh, I have a little history when they, not, I'm mixing species. When they put the wolves in the park and said, if they come out, they're non experiment they're non-essential experimental, you guys can kill them. How'd that go? It didn't. But so was the federal government involved. Well, Thank if you, you think you can, if you, <clears throat> if you think you can put those sheep on private ground, and it won't affect BLM. I think you haven't dealt with the BLM long enough. Uh, these guys up here are really good to work with right now. Uh, they take orders from up above them. So, you know, that's a concern. I know you, you know, you've made a very good presentation. It's been fair, factual, but the BLM's out there and they're not gonna remain a, a non-entity. When these things start to roll out, they will take action. And if they don't, somebody above them is going to say that. So I guess that's why I'm, that's my concern. Yeah. This and introduction will affect grazing permits, you know, your ability to use your permit and to graze your cattle and livestock because those restrictions don't, they aren't species specific. Sheep and cattle will give for the bighorn sheep. And if, and I think that's what Director Nesvik's point is, if that happens, the sheep will be gone. Well, there's various effects. I mean, you know, that's why I was trying to pin down exactly what you meant, is if it affects grazing permits negatively, they'll go. I would wager two or three nickels that that would never happen, so. Let me just... I, and let me take this opportunity and read from Director Nesvik's letter. Is 
So it says the commission supports multiple use in domestic livestock grazing as one of the many uses on federally managed lands. Should reintroduced bighorn sheep be used as an instrument to negatively impact public land grazing in the area, the department will remove bighorn sheep. Remove the bighorn sheep. Scott? The decision's already been made at that point. Say it's an RMP amendment or some change in the RMP. It's already in there. Even if you go in and take the beat, the, the bighorn sheep out. Well, but I anticipate that an RMP amendment process is a public process that has to go through NEPA. Yep. We're going to be involved in that. We'd remove them before it got to that point. Okay. <laughs> Theoretically, yeah. Well, <laughs> doesn't mean it still won't go into play. We can play what else for sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. I don't mean to cause problems, but what if you have, I mean, it happens everywhere. The death in the family, change of ownership, change of management with two major private landowners that are promoting this, which is great. Um, I can see their point of view. But what if you have a big change there and somebody says, I don't want this. I'm going to raise sheep now. Well, again, there's no sheep allotments within that polygon. Right. We right. would have to accept the risk. I'm just, you know, just, what if the, yeah. that's an extreme to say, I'm going to raise sheep now. Yeah. But what if they go and say, you know what? I don't like providing water in the winter for sheep. I don't like the things that we have set in place to yeah. have sheep out here because it can happen tomorrow. Yeah, we, we see it yeah. happen all the time, the change yeah. of big companies or small companies or whatever. Yeah. So Yeah, no, you bring up a valid point. That that's something that we would have to adapt at, to, learn to live with and change. Hold also, on, Justin. Oh, sorry. It also seems that directors of the game and fish would change as well. They will. So will that this is a, this is a department commission, not a director commission or commitment, excuse me. Okay. Lloyd, hold on just a minute. If you'll hang on to your thought. Justin, did you have your hand up? Yeah, just a brief statement and saying you only mentioned that he wouldn't support converting from paddle to sheep. Um, office that needs to also be stated is that as a group that you wouldn't support conversion from sheep to cattle for the sole purpose of providing a buffer and assurance to big one sheep or anything else is that based on this map is that we support current management and grazing and that there wouldn't have to be future shifts or conversions from sheep to cattle to support big one sheep. Nobody should ever convert anyway, just because you lose so much in the process. But yes, we just have, are, are used to other places that have had a significant shift from sheep to cattle for whatever reason and inclusive of big one sheep. And from a department perspective, we don't see the need to just to, to go there for this if it were to go forward. Lloyd. I was just going to ask you, maybe the director Medwick, if, if that language that he expresses in that letter, if, if we need to codify that. In state statute. In statute. Like we did with, like you guys did with the Encampment River. And then that <clears> might take some of that. What if out of the out of the pictures? Would you, okay. Would you just maybe yep. ask him and, and then we can consider? Yep. We can pass that up the chain. You'll be very interested in your input. Hold on just a minute, Chris. Um, how does the the uh, little mountain uh, herd compare to ones that you plan on? Introducing here, mm -hmm. Little Mountain, South of Rock Springs. No, Little Mountain out of level. Oh, so that's Devil's Canyon. Yeah. It, so how does it compare? Yeah, in terms of uh, their ability to survive or, or 
in good yeah. conditions. Yeah, they they are a flourishing herd. They are our source for for reintroduction. Yeah, I mean, I've, I spent a lot of time up there, so I see them a lot. Yeah, they are doing very well. Yeah. Yeah, and above and a little bit above objective. So we need to also bear in mind that we have no no place else in Wyoming to go with those sheep, and we have the obligation to keep it within its objective. So this would also, if this were to go forward, give us an outlet for Wyoming sheep to be put elsewhere in Wyoming. And they they have quite a few uh, grazing allotments up there. Cattle grazing. So they have cattle grazing allotments and then they have a trailing permit for domestic sheep on the south side of Cottonwood Canyon and those sheep are kept north of Cottonwood Canyon yeah. by lethal removal for that purpose. Does that help? Yeah, I was just yeah, curious about that a little bit. Okay, Chris? Well, I was just going to tack on to the, the, the codifying of the the removals and, and statute, and, and it has been done. I think in this existing statute, it's, it's for non emphasis removal effects. And then we had uh, the Darby herd that was done um, several years ago, also that had uh, for non emphasis, you know, your, your first map of non emphasis there. It did have language in there for removal of, of all wild sheep if, if the forest did make a decision that affected. Livestock grazing. So on the, the southern Wyoming range down there. Yeah. yeah. But I think it's a, I think that's an interesting concept to, to apply here on a cooperative review. Well, and I think Chris, help me, Lloyd, Chris, didn't they, didn't the legislature do that for the encampment river herd? Yeah. So. Just like three or four years ago. There was a sunset on that statute, if I remember right, but it, I know the Darby had the, had the sunset. I'm not sure. I'm Darby not. was the most recent, correct? Yeah. And uh, so I've done it in a cooperative review area before. Anyway, so yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's ever been done in a cooperative review, but definitely for the Darby. And then uh, yeah. I think it's an interesting idea for the right. The oh yeah. Box. Yep. Anything yeah. else on the internet, Jason? On Zoom? No. No. Yes. Liz. Did they have to remove the sheep then? I don't think we ever did, and the encampment herd. I don't think we ever did. The Darby. So, the the Darby is interesting. That's a Bridger Teeth. Now about. wait a minute. We can't open a can of worms here. Liz went there. But uh, uh, so so far, there's been several allotments that uh, um, were waived without preference back to the Bridger Tetons, and the forest did a good job to leave them in a vacant status. But that's been over seven years ago, and we have several domestic sheep producers have asked for use on those, and the and the uh, the forest is is delaying those until something. So a decision hasn't been made to say no, and if it did, then I think the stat the state has uh, every right to say remove those. But currently, there hasn't been a decision to say no on those. It's just. They're not saying yes, and it's been over seven years with several up to 14 permittees asking for those domestic sheep allotments. So, so I don't, I don't think there's any been any negative decisions in the, the non emphasis today. Um, but uh, um, currently, we have there's a plan amendment also for the British Tetons, and I think some of the wild uh, sheep folks have written a letter to increase the buffers into the non emphasis. If that did occur, that should be a negative <clears throat> uh, impact for that also. And we should remove the wild sheep and also. And they, I, I believe that the Green River cattle were trying to get some ex additional cattle permits. Yeah, that's, and they were yeah. uh, refusing to do that. So there's there is there so they're they're the actually green. Yeah. yeah, the upper green. Yeah. And uh that's a project that we're working on uh, through the state through good neighbor agreement, but uh same thing for um, domestic sheep allotments waived um, and uh, put into a vacant status. And the beer critter teeth on this evaluating that through NEPA to change a class for domestic sheep to um, cattle. But that is different because that is coordinated. Okay, Carol, one more question. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Are there any hunter management agreements out in this area? Or say elk or anything, and because what one of the things that when you have proposals that come, that's a reflection of changing ownership and the changing society, and, and so when you have these blocks which start to accumulate, that creates pressures for neighbors in in other ways. Say say there's 
not as much hunting anymore. <clears throat> and those elk just build up and they spill over. And, and they really spill. And then and so you're left with this the spillover effects from the change in ownership go, go past the sheep. So you're ending, you end up with neighbors that have over time, they maybe they had 20 elk, and then they have a hundred elk, and then they have a thousand elk. And so is there have, have these new owners approached to, you know, this has there been any suggestion that, you know, some of the mitigating effects of this change in ownership? I guess I would direct the question to, to Billy and your right. Well, would you allow public hunting and this kind of stuff? I mean, we almost don't have to because there's so much public there in the field and it's everywhere. The only way we don't allow it is right there by the lodge on our, our pay ground. And it's not that we're harboring the elk that then spill over. It's the hunters on Green Mountain, usually on opening day, push all the elk across the highway to us. <laughs> So it's the other way around. Um, and our gates would always be open for big horn sheep hunters on the one condition that I get to go with them because that's the size of one. <laughs> and I know I'll never be able to draw a tag. And we have had the same commitment from Pathfinder for sheep so yeah. to allow access, public access. Yeah, that was made to the commission. So. Anyone? Does that answer your help? Yeah, that's very right. helpful. Real quick, Daryl. Um, I did find the Encampment River sheep statute. It was in 2013. Um, and yeah, just, just what you said. If we uh, basically the legislature provided some money for us to go in and remove sheep if it became an issue. Um, yeah. How important is genetic uh, diversity and connectivity? Because you're, you know, you've got people of spots around there. Um, mm -hmm. Is that gonna? I mean, because we're dealing with sheep that are gonna stay right where you plant them, mm -hmm. that you don't have to worry about that. They haven't been a problem either in their source, where they where they live in the John Day of Oregon is a really confined area. The Devil's Canyon herd unit is is basically that portion of the Cooperative Review area, a very confined area, about two hundred and twenty five sheep. So that hasn't been an issue. Anywhere in Wyoming, but more importantly in Oregon, that's not an issue. They thrive. And what drives my question is, what set of the <coughs> safety grouse management team it seemed like my whole life it started <laughs> off with core areas. Okay, they, we're going to protect these, and everybody else gets to go about their business. Pretty soon we had connectivity, and we had expanding core. So these plans sound real good when you start. I hear you, Doug, but you know what I'm talking about? You're dealing with a whole different beast. I mean, bighorn sheep are not threatened. They're not in danger. They're not being proposed. That's a whole different ballpark to be playing at that. this point in time. Well, it's a fed to wade into it. And the environmental activists haven't weighed into this whole deal. So I'm I'm skeptical. How is that? That's fair. That's good. I think we need to look at it from all points of view. One more comment online. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I know this came up once already in here, but um, Sweetwater Rocks Habitat is probably the most viable bighorn sheep transplant site in the United States. Um, and then this individual also said it'd be a shame um, from a public trust perspective to let this opportunity die. <coughs> Anything else? Any other thoughts? Daryl, I also did bring in the talking points that we put oh, in the landowners. Oh, to Justin's, yeah, if and you want to. If they'd be valuable, I could read them to the whole group, and then Justin, I can let you take Say, this sorry, copy. Was it again? These are the talking points that we presented to the landowners when we met with them. You asked us what, what did we present to them to face their that comments on. Now. So it's would it be a benefit for all of you guys to hear how we presented this to landowners? No. no. It would be a benefit to me. I'll take the copy and I'll probably do it. Right if there was there. any interest, I was willing to let everyone know how we kind of jumped into this with landowners. Yeah. But, so. Well, Justin, I would get that a copy to you. But. Okay. I'll give you this. Thank you. It's been rolling around in the truck for a while. Oh, no. <laughs> you got a couple more questions. Yes, yeah, sir. Um, on your presentation here, 
under cooperative review, this uh, proposed changes in bighorn sheep management and domestic sheep use will be cooperatively evaluated. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was why I asked what's the working group, because I'm assuming they will be part of this. Mm -hmm. But when you say cooperatively evaluated, what, what's that mean? We're working through that, right, guys? Folks, we've never done so that the interaction working group has never entertained a proposal like this. And so we're, we're trying to figure out what that means specifically. But here at DeFore, it's been, it's been the, the working group meeting that we had last Tuesday where we basically had these same discussions and identified the public land grazing. I think it's fair to say, help me, that public land grazing is the primary issue that needs to be addressed. And so that was a discussion. That's the result of a discussion held last uh, week, a week ago today, um, with the cooperative, with the interaction working group. Well, your statement that you have these core people, but whoever else shows up gets to participate in that yeah. evaluation. Yeah, that's pretty unaccountable. Well, it, I, and I won't argue with you, but that certainly is the way that working group has been set up. And again, it's been doing it that way for 20 plus years. And then the net in your non-emphasis area, it said no effort will be made to prioritize or emphasize bighorn sheep unless agreed to by this nebulous working group. Yeah. That's doesn't give me a warm, fuzzy feeling. And and I and and I hear you, but just recognize that we're not talking about a non-emphasis area. We're talking about a cooperative review area with the Sweetwater on at this point. Well, it it that it, and I and I think maybe it's important to say that any changes to that map would have to would require a change in state statute. That yeah. map was agreed to. Those those management schemes for those geographic areas was agreed to by that interaction working group over the course of years of debate and intercourse so it took a lot of effort to get to that point chris and i think you're right i think to change this map in statute and through uh, rule it's it's pretty clear that the three heads of the agencies uh, livestock board at department of ag and the game fish would all have to agree to whatever changes. So a proposal would have to go through the working group. Um, and there is no voting, there is no consensus in there at all, but it'd have to go through them through recommendations and the proposal could come to change the maps, but- um, But that would have to be approved by the legislature in the end. No, I think in, in rule, it, it says that in the, rule, the three okay. agencies can, can make changes, but it's, it'd be hard to, okay. to get yeah, something passed, I think, through there. Okay, thanks for the clarity. What else? Everybody quit yawning. <laughs> Anything else? Again, let me just go to this last page because I want to make sure that if you have written comments that you get them to me one way or the other. So, Joni? Is it good yawn? No. Yeah, I'm dyslexic. <laughs> Thanks a lot. You all know where they're sitting. I should yep. say something because I, Liz? Um, I have the, or what, our family has the grazing allotment to the north. And it's just maybe. So this one, Liz? Yes. Yeah. And we have a permit for 1,200 sheep, domestic sheep, for seven months. And um, I guess we've always been in the sheep business. We like to run them together with our cattle and keep the predators controlled for the sheep and the cattle. Try to anyway. Um, and uh, my fear is the the non-governmental organizations suing the BLM for not protecting the bighorn sheep. 
and um, that will come back on us. And um, <coughs> if there happens to be a die off in those sheets, they'll look directly at us because we have a nearby domestic sheet for. Because there have been bios and bighorn sheep in Wyoming, and they they were no, nowhere near the domestic sheep groups. Uh, I don't know where they determine that the pneumonia comes from in those cases. Yeah, in some cases we don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't, I guess I don't agree that if you convert from cattle to sheep that you will lose a lambs. but that's not the case in our case. Um, or vice versa. And I think the predators are in the position. Appreciate the comments. Did you say that public access would be available in that area? There's quite a bit of public access into the rocks, not necessarily easy access, but it's it's accessible. You know that. I I better know. Not be. Well, that's why I heard because I know both those big outfits they control the access, and you know because I've hunted elk down there. <clears throat> previously with previous owners and change of ownership all those roads go close so that's you know you said there was a, a, a deal okay public access for sheep hunting well it isn't the other species aren't involved in that and that can change with change of ownership absolutely. is that correct that, absolutely that's correct yep. do you have one more comment uh, online Gerald? Um, just you know, basically asking um, or, or stating um, that there is an economic value to establish bighorn sheep um, in these areas, and and asking folks, um, landowners, to to reach out to other landowners in Laramie Peak, um, Ferris Seminole, who have you know who have sheep around, um, just to to get their viewpoints. Okay. Chris, just. Uh... One recommendation, Daryl, for, for the, the working group piece of this. Um, I think you could admit that a lot has changed since last Tuesday. Um, I think wholeheartedly a lot has changed. So I'd, I'd recommend you know, what we discussed today we should go back to that working group because that's I think it's very different than what we talked about. What are you hearing that's different, Chris? Help me. We talked about assurances. Most of that discussion was saying you yeah, actually created a subgroup to um, Look at assurances, yeah. Um, but today, your very your assurance is very strong with the the, um, the director's letter, and you've expanded that. But the, the discussion with the assurances also was not based on Onipa that you're now saying that 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 was wasn't brought up to that working group meeting, which is really the crux of of this entire discussion. I think that. Uh, um, if that was discussed at the working group, which it wasn't, that's brand new tonight and not at Jeffrey City either. So I'm just making a recommendation that it'd be good to probably explain that to the that working group again. The, the our understanding of NEPA? No, the, your recommendation is to put them on private fund to, you know, definitely strengthen the, the discussion with your, your red line there. That wasn't there. Previously, either to the working group. Oh, uh, yeah, up, correct. That yeah. showed up in Jeffrey City. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, that's just a recommendation, you know, that, that yeah, working that's group, group, I was there and all this was new, is new to me. Yeah, no, that's a good point, especially with the polygon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What else? What's the next step? 
comments by the 15th. Yeah, we'd like comments by next Monday if you can, because the the region needs to step away from these two meetings that we've had, and and we need to digest all that we've heard and make some recommendations and have some further discussion and and debate internally about where we go from here, and then we will come back to y'all on December 14th and 15th at least with an update, maybe a proposal depending on what's decided. The 14th in Jeffrey City, the 15th here in Lander. So if that turns into a proposal, is that proposal <clears throat> then being provided to BLM? Or yes, as soon as it, if, if we develop a proposal that's, <laughs> that's agreed to within the department, then absolutely, yeah. Scott, what are your metrics for deciding whether this is a successful proposal or not, whether to move forward or not? Yeah, that's a good question and one that we're going to need to talk about. You know, certainly I can tell you that from a biological perspective, <coughs> just looking at habitat suitability, given the analysis that we've been given and, and, and have paid for, and the risk of contact analysis, that metric's met. So then I think it becomes one of of um, decisions made above my pay grade in terms of socio-political concerns. Does that make sense? It, it does, yeah. And what, it, just as a follow-up, the, the last two, 2009, 2013, 14, 14, 15, what, what made those ones fail? Or what did those? I think it's fair to say politics, that there was just enough opposition and concern that, that people weren't ready to go forward. Both within our agency and, and the public, like a lot, Land of, a lot of similar concern. I mean, a lot, a lot of things we're hearing now, similar to the last times, but um, just things took a different path, I guess. Um, yeah. Floyd, so we we talked about, or we've had discussions in this meeting about possible response by the Department of Interior that would have further impacts. Is there any discussion on the possibility of approaching them and saying, we have a proposal to put these sheep here if we have assurances from the Department of Interior that they'll comply with this component and not impact raising leases in, in anything and of that nature? Is that possible? I, I think it's possible, Lloyd, and I'm and I don't know that those discussions are happening at levels far above me, but my impression is they are. I but I don't know that. Well, it seems logical to me, at least, my feeble mind to, to think that maybe if, if we felt that this was a a worthy proposal, that before we commit ourselves and impact people someplace down the road adversely, that um, maybe we try and get that commitment from them. So well, and that's part of what the working interaction working group, Chris mentioned that we they convened a small working group and they're going to meet again on December 12th to try to work through and brainstorm some of that. So people are thinking about it. Well, that would certainly, if, because if that's in December and you're thinking about making a proposal after the first of the year, it seems like that that would certainly push that back. It could. Considerably, because you'd want to make sure that you could get those assurance before you yeah, commit. Could, and that's why it. I said by the middle of December, we're at least going to come back to you with an update right. and maybe a proposal. Right. Maybe. Right. And I, I think during the working group, is is clear by, by both stock growers and wool growers that uh, that, that was the desire that they would not support doing a thing moving forward until such assurances were. Um, were met with the BLM. And I think that was the discussion is if it would, it would definitely push um, that timeline back a little bit for BLM as a beast in itself that to, to try to get an assurance um, may be that difficult in that timeline. Yeah. Mac. Also, he noted just what Chris was saying. Um, we as wild sheep agreed them as well that we need those assurances for the domestic operator at our working group meeting that's yeah. why the subcommittee 
Exactly. Reality. And I think the subcommittee was Wild Sheep and Older. It, it is. It is. Yeah, it was, it was a, Jason, if you wouldn't mind, I've got a run on the report. Yeah, I think that uh, pretty optimistic seeing something go down in February. And I think we all agreed at that working group meeting that we had to have those assurances from Wild Sheep perspective as well as, as uh, domestic. Right. And that's not going to happen in this year, probably. In, in that time frame. Right. Yeah. I mean, let's be real. Yeah. Jason, I think that's Lloyd brought up a really good point is this is all being viewed from game fish in the proponents and landowners. But mm -hmm. to, to leave the BLM out of it is, I mean, I've dealt with them a little bit. And you don't do anything fast around them. So, and without those assurances that there won't be, they won't allow this harm to domestic grazing. I think you're by the point of trouble there. Okay. And that's the reason I asked the question at the grazing board meeting. And they said, well, we're neutral. Well, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Maybe they're just not way into this deal. But I think if this moves forward, somebody's got to get the BLM to say yay or nay and get them in black and white, not some field manager saying, oh yeah, that'd be okay. Right. Something right. Yeah. Very important. I was just going to say, I kind of agree with Doug and Lloyd that the time, the, the speed is pretty fast here. And we have some permits to the Southwest down here that are it took 12 years to get them into either or and and so to do this in you know less than a year and a half is pretty fast and I, I do think that you should really follow up on Lloyd's suggestion to get something from if there's if these two landowners have this type of motivation hopefully they're working the Department of Interior for that same level of commitment too because it's you know, part of that should should fall on their shoulders, not not the not the departments. I'm not sure that's fair for you guys to lobby the Department of Interior on behalf of a of a proponent. You know, you you said that this was a unique scenario and it provided opportunity. And I think it does provide that opportunity in in the flexibility standpoint. And so, I would encourage you to keep your track on the flexible track. And if you have to slow down to do that. You'll, you'll get a better product in the end than just trying to hustle it through to meet kind of arbitrary deadlines. Okay. Matt, Doug, you might also mention at our working group meeting the other day, um, one real important thing that we all agreed on was for this to ever really go forward, there would have to be a memorandum of understanding. And Something written stone, and 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 as from the wild sheep perspective, mm -hmm. we want that as much as the domestic. So, yeah, and it needs to be, and that won't happen in, in a hurry. But it's just something that uh, you know we need to mention here that it's going to be part of this process. Sure, I appreciate that. Yeah, I'll add on to your point. So we're not taking this lightly, and we don't want to lose any AUMs on our allotments. But one of the big things you need to emphasize on this is that the mountains themselves are not included in the allotments to start with. And even if we had, say, two, three, four hundred sheep in that entire mountain range, if you add up all those AUMs, it's not honestly that much if you transfer a wild sheep like AUM to a cattle. And I don't think people are really talking about that. I think they're talking about the bigger picture of the well, they're the not with the BLM. I don't think people are, but, really but the big horn sheep, so worst case scenario, yeah. say, you know, a thousand of them. Is all. They're not going to cover the entire landscape and steal other people's AU, AUMs off allotments. The majority of those allotments are held by a couple of entities. I think the and I have is, wild sheep on another one of my ranches, and we've had no problems. We have we have federal ground. The sheep stick to themselves, and the steep gnarly stuff you can't even stand up on. The cows, the horses are pretty easy stuff. No problems at all. And actually, some of those sheep were from that Green Day or. Uh, John John herd. And then on the other side of that ranch, there's another herd of wild sheep that came from Wyoming with a swap of some other animals. I can't remember what. 
We've been around this quite a bit and we haven't had any any problems. Yeah. But we hear what you're saying, Jim. Really too. Scott? And I think the issue is BLM's management decisions aren't going to stay within that part of that. Yeah, that's what Jim's. Yeah. Yeah. Point. Thank you. Yeah. I think we've had a couple more comments online just about similar things, looking at alternatives, looking at other ways to get assurances, um, things like that. So yeah. it, it is being talked about. I know it's been talked about numerous times, even in channels. So. Yeah. Okay. Liz, you're on the edge of your seat. Oh, I thought that was a good comment. The BLMs. Decision aren't going to make uh, contained within the polygon. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. You wore out? Yes. Yeah. I'm reinvigorated. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> Well, that's all we've got. So I don't want to hold you here any longer than you want to be here, but but we're here. So again, despite the wrong zip code, <laughs> mail your comments to me or, or get on the internet, log on and, and fill out that form. And we'll be assimilating all those comments, both for our internal assessment and for the commission review. Thank you for a fair presentation. Yeah, well, yeah I agree. we appreciate it. We are here to listen. So that's what we. <laughs> But we do. If anybody missed out.